on that one, we intentionally said, it's just us. Like everything on here, if there's a sound we want, we create it, not pull it up off the internet or whatever. That was pretty special, especially for this space. And I didn't have to write any lyrics to it. So that was fun. Just had to get to go right into the creative production side of it. And, but that was probably my most enjoyable song to record on this album because it felt like when we first started back in the day, we couldn't afford to have an album budget. We were making up sounds in our, in our house and rolling stuff down the hallway and trying to mic it like it's funny it's like when you don't have a budget it's amazing how creative you get and uh, it was fun to kind of go back to that that kind of headspace and and how it turned out we wanted to make something incredibly beautiful and i think we did welcome to episode 129 of the nrt now podcast i'm your host jake and if this is your first time here just want to wish you a warm welcome and if you've been here for a while a very warm welcome back and if you haven't already, make sure that you like, subscribe, follow, whatever that looks like on your favorite podcast platform so you know when new episodes come out. So our guest for this episode is Bart Millard of Mercy Me. So as we're connecting to Zoom and we're getting the interview started, I was wearing my Texas Rangers baseball hat, like I always do. And Bart being a native or you're coming from the Dallas area here, he's like, man, love your hat. I'm like, well, of course, it's the best team. Appreciate it. And he's like, well, in some ways. And in my mind, I'm like going like, bro, like they're the best team. We're, what are you doing to your, our team? I thought about it for a minute and I'm like, well, yeah, we do suck. I get it. I get it. We have a good laugh, but we really do love you Rangers. We really do. But no, this was just such a fun conversation with Bart. And I love getting to dig into why they named this album, what the heart of this album always only Jesus is. So with that, here's the conversation with Bart Millard. So we're here with Bart with Mercy Me. Bart, just so good to have you on here. And man, we're about a week away as we're recording this from release day. Yeah, finally. It's, um, it's well, I can't even say it's been a long time coming. I feel like we just released an album not long ago during the pandemic, but I've lost all concept of time. So it's, but yes, I'm glad to have a new album coming out. Time has just been irrelevant. I talk about this a lot here, but I mean, it's like we have like this huge fuzzy gap right in the middle of life here. Yeah, we really like we our last album in Hell XL, we ended up recording during the pandemic and then when things kind of we started kind of sort of getting back to normal, we were ready to move on to that that album kind of served its purpose for us and we were ready to move on and we literally thought we were releasing one 30 days later is what it felt like and then I think our contract is like 18 to 24 months between albums and this will be right at 18 or 19 months. So, but it feels like it was a week ago to release last record. <laughs> Well, before we get going too far, I've got to get something off my chest here, Bart. Yeah. So this is going all the way back to I can only imagine days. Like this is the okay. throwback. You know, so it's 7 a.m. You're driving to work first thing in the morning. I can only imagine comes on and you're just like, man, I love this song. Turn it up. You know, it starts out great. You know, I can only imagine, you know, like it's like right nice and low. And then it right. kind of a minute later it goes, it kind of pops up a little bit, you know, surrounded by uh, Sorry for everybody listening. I'm doing this acapella in front of Mercy Me. This is, yeah, uh, top 10 embarrassing moments for a thousand, please, Alex. <laughs> but so you're going along, you know, at seven in the morning, like it's it's okay. And then all of a sudden, out of the middle of nowhere, you go up to like the stratosphere. I'm not even going to try. You go up in the middle of nowhere. It comes by surprise. And all of a sudden it's hurt. Like my rock star dreams are crushed because you can't hit that. Like at seven o'clock in the morning, my voice hurts. You know, like it's just terrible. Like, why do you got to do that to us? Like it sneaks up on you. Man, I was young back then. I think even now live, we do it like a whole step down or something because I'm like, I'm just too tired to hit those high notes too. But no, I don't know. I, I, I was going for it back then. I was a big Michael English fan and thought I could hit the high notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did. I mean, this, that range is just absolutely incredible. I don't know how long I've, how many times I've listened to that song and it hits me every single time. Like it surprises me every single time. Yeah, we've had a few, it's kind of like the Star Spangled Banner. You better start low because we, we've seen videos on, social media stuff where people just start singing it, but they start high. And by the end, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Them trying to hit it and about blow a vein <laughs> with that. I mean, you have that one came out, Oh man, almost 20 uh, it is a little over 20 years, isn't it? When yeah, it 2001. It's probably, yeah. I think one or two around there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that song has been out for 20 years and you've had such a career in between. Was that one of your debut songs? If I remember right. 
Yeah, it was our first, uh, it was our, let's see, we released a single, we had just signed and then released one single that tanked and then that was our second single. So yeah, it was, it was, it's probably the first song anybody at radio actually heard because the first one they never heard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so we're talking, you know, 20, 21 years later, you guys have had so many songs come through, so many albums, so many awards. You guys have had just such a storied career. And so now as we get to this new album that we're going to talk about here, like it sounds like a Mercy Me album, but it doesn't at the same time. There's so much more that's ha happening in this album. What has been that journey? I mean, what keeps you guys going fresh? What keeps you guys, you know, moving forward in your creativity instead of just kind of releasing the same album over and over again? Well, I appreciate that. We, we try like, um, you know, it's not like reinventing the wheel or anything, but for us just to get together and just try things that we haven't tried before. Like, like I, I would say it's interesting with this one in hell, exhale, the album before this, was probably one of the more creative albums we've done because we just kind of went all over the place and had so much time to, to mess around with it in the pandemic and um, going through that process and then seeing where it feels like the body of Christ is more divided now than they ever have been with what we've gone through. And, and it's like, man, I think our little part in this whole thing is to try to unify the body any way we can. And we realize that the only way that's going to happen, we may disagree on things, but there has to be a common denominator of Jesus. And the half of this album was leftover songs from the last last record. And we thought we were going to do a, an EP around the song, Then Christ Came. And it ultimately became a full record. We saw there's this theme of like, not only is everything verted like there's no clever way around or whatever. It's all about Jesus from beginning to end and very black and white. And it was a little unintentional, but it felt like we were going back. Like you said, it does sound like mercy me, like the God with us, all of creation and stuff. And it was, I think for our own sake, it just felt like there's just times where it's like, man, I need to lean into a nice warm blanket and just hold on here. And we never really said this is what we're good at, but it just felt very natural. And, and the process was actually pretty quick uh, going through it because we weren't spending so much time going, Hey, we've never done this. Let's figure it out. Let's try this. It just felt like we knew these songs already. And, and that was kind of the intention was that, you know, whether we do it well, what do we think we do well? And that we've done for a long time that feels like it's, we just didn't want any distractions of, Hey, we've never used a DJ in a turntable and done techno music or whatever <laughs> we wanted just to be, this is what we've done and, and tried to do well for a long time. And so it should, it should sound familiar if you're a mercy me fan, I think, but, it, but at the same time, it's, it's new to us and it's um, you know, we still try some things, but NL XL was just like, there's a lot of time on our hands and we went from, even if on one record to a disco solid Gloria Gaynor, which we loved, but this is just like, Hey man, all hands on deck. This needs to point towards Jesus. Cause that's what I think everybody needs to be reminded of more than ever. Yeah. I mean, especially over these last two years, I mean, this is becoming a common theme just because number one, we see it just day in, day out. I mean, social media just has this in our face so much. And I think right. one of the habits that we picked up in 2020, you know, as the pandemic started is everything started coming through, our devices through social media, through, you know, whatever that is, because we we're stuck at home and that's kind of what we had. Right. You know, and now we're on the other side of this, you know, we're starting to come back together. Tours are starting to come back full force. I mean, we still see masks. We still see, you know, some of the lingering effects of a lot of this, but I think one of the habits that still is stuck is just everybody in their corners combative a little bit just because sure we've been all funneled through this particular medium and this particular channel and right. into this particular mindset. And what do they say? It takes 60 days to create a new habit. Mm. And we had way more than 60 days. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think everybody's got kind of got regardless of where you are and what you believe, everybody's kind of got fed up. And I mean, we all did. And now I, I have dear friends of mine that drew some pretty hard lines in the sand and stood up for things that were kind of surprising and just, you know, things that some of us may have disagreed on and like, wow, this is, it was almost shocking. And now you have people trying to walk it back or pretending it never happened or trying to explain themselves. And I don't know much how much healing that is trying to justify to someone else. And that's when we were like, man, I grew up Southern Baptist next door to a Methodist church. So we definitely disagreed on some things, but if we're both pursuing Jesus, I can live with that as long as he's at the core of it. And that's all this album and our touring is, is about right now. It's just, just even if it's for an hour and a half or however long in a show to get several thousand people to agree on something would just feels like a massive win right now. <laughs> I know, right? Standing on anything seems to be a problem. 
Yeah, yeah. We were we saw this over and over that you got all these crazy movements and things that people are standing up for, but it feels like the craziest movement at all would be grace and forgiveness right now with this way society is, and that sounds the most insane to most people. And and you know, and I'm hoping it's one of those things where the pendulum swings the other way into where. I've talked about how, you know, the, if you watch a movie, the hero, he always comes in in the most horrible time, the, the, the most desperate time. If he comes in the first five minutes, it's not a great movie. So I like, maybe we're setting the stage for something amazing. I sure hope so. And I don't think I was old enough to be around for this, but I mean, you hear about these big tent revivals and I mean, these massive revivals that yeah. happened was, it, I think the seventies and eighties. Yeah. They've been going on since the forties. Yeah. yeah. That's like Billy Graham got his start kind of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of revivals, especially in the 80s, 90s. It kind of had a a resurgence of that. And I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing, I mean, people are desperate enough to where they want to find answers and they want to find a truth that stops moving faster than anything is what it feels like. And so uh, I think it's primed and ready for the gospel to to be more relevant than ever. And I said this not long ago, but it's, it's almost like we've had a paper cut. And when you put salt or lemon juice, like something comes across the paper cut, you don't always see that paper cut. But when right. you, you sure feel it when, you know, some yeah, totally. something comes around and, you know, I think we, we got that salt on the paper cut and <laughs> right. we're really feeling the effects of that. Yeah. hundred percent. One of the things that, you know, I was seeing, you normally write songs coming from a place of pain from your life experience. And as a songwriter, it sometimes becomes your burden. You know, it's your stories. It's your, the stuff that you've gone through personally that you're kind of rehashing and kind of pushing out. And now, like, it just seems like this one is one that we're all kind of the songwriters in. You know, this is something that's all of us, and this is all of our stuff that is kind of flowing through. And listening to some of the songs that came out from it, it really does feel like it's our songs, not just Bart songs. Yeah, because, I mean, you can definitely justify that, you know, we all go through loss, we go through pain or whatever, but has there been a time in our lives to where we can honestly say we just went through the same thing together? And so uh, I had plenty of pain and suffering to tap into to writing, but the difference was that we all can not only remotely relate, like 100% directly relate. And, and that's why I felt like I don't need to describe what I'm going through in these songs. This is just going straight to here's the solution. Here it is. It's Jesus. And there, there's a moment in some of those personal songs to where you, you want them to know where you're coming from and then connect with them. And I think we all got that part. And so it's just, you know, so we just go straight to the solution. I'm always terrible about song names, especially because I haven't got to spend a lot of time with the song names here with the new album. But I mean, there's a song that's a little bit later down the track or down the, down the list. It's uh, there came Jesus or then came Jesus. Uh, Then Christ came. Then Christ came. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for being my, uh, my encyclopedia for this song. I'm glad I know him. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of like the big thing right now is like, that's what we need is like, then Christ came, you know, in the Mm -hmm. middle of all of this. Yeah, that, that song, I've had this weird obsession for years and years and years with the song Breath of Heaven by Amy Grant because I love musically everything. She kind of sets up this this tension, and when it gets to the chorus, it resolves in this beautiful chord progression and Breath of Heaven. It's just like this this exhale. It's an amazing, like, it, everything it does musically, lyrically, and then Christ came was kind of, I remember referencing that. It was just like, man, it's, it's I once was lost, but now I'm found. It's This is what I was before. Jesus stepped in and he just messed everything up in a good way. He's like the cheat code to the game that can't be beat is what it feels like. And so that was one of those moments to where the, the music and the lyrics kind of locked in. It was right. And and we literally call it like the breath of heaven effect. (laughs) (laughs) And then one of the other songs kind of going back to, you know, what we pour into ourselves, like, you know, we've been pouring a lot of social media, a lot of news, you know, a lot of stuff, digital content, but I'm totally putting myself on the spot with these. How can we not praise? Oh yeah. To not worship you. To not worship. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, Yeah, It's a weird title. (laughs) (laughs) So we come into, to not worship you. I mean, it's like, you know, if we pour in and really see what God has done, what Jesus has done, I mean, like the export of that is like, how can we not praise? How can that not be just who we are if that's what's coming in? Yeah, that came out of just uh, having uh, people that we know kind of going through the whole deconstruction of their faith or whatever that is. And and us having discussions and talking about like, you know, man, I think I've kicked the tires of my faith quite a bit asking, you know, why does bad things happen to good people, whatever. I just didn't get an Instagram account and promote it or whatever. And, <laughs> and so like 
I think we've all asked the hard questions, but then in our conversation was like, but how, when you see this of God, when you realize he's this and this big, when you remember these things, how, how do you not worship him? And I had that conversation. I was like, I think we just landed on a song and just started writing it, but it was literally out of a conversation with a band of like, like, how are you able to forget how big God is enough to, to go down that path? I don't know. It's a, but yeah, that's kind of where that song came from. Yeah. I mean, it's super powerful. Just, you know, as Christians, what are we exuding? Are we, you know, on Instagram, just firing off stuff or, you know, just arguing, you know, being combative and all that, right. or, you know, what are we showing the world, you know, in, in this time with all the stuff going on, what are we showing what Christ is? And I mean, there's right. a quote of, you know, if, if all I had to base Christ on and Christianity is watching Christians, I probably wouldn't sign up. All right. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of truth to that, man. I remember uh, when I was in youth group, we used to go take out these little witnessing tracks and go and we call it, sharing Jesus, but we just like throw a track at somebody at Taco Bell and like, you need Jesus and run away because you're so scared. And I remember doing it one time and whoever it got thrown to in Taco Bell, I was like, I had to be like seventh grade. It was crazy. And uh, that's what you do in the Bible Belt. Uh, <laughs> and the guy goes, if heaven's full of you people, I choose hell. I never forget him saying that and was like, oh man, what are we doing? Like it stuck with me for forever. And it was like, sadly, there might be a little truth to that the way we act sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I just love the reminders that come through all the way through this album, just mm -hmm. of making sure that Jesus is first, just kind of going back to the revival timeline. I mean, I think this is just a, that, a good spot to just recenter ourselves, to just pull back that revival and make sure that that is the center. And this is where we're going. And like I said, I just love that from the top to the bottom of this album in an age of playlists where you, know, you just pick the one yeah. song here or there that comes out of it. You know, like I said, this is an album that you know, just from top to bottom is just, if you let that really just soak in, it's a really good recentering kind of album. Yeah. And that was the point. It was like, even the artwork, everything is like stripped down, very basic, just because we want that to be the point. And one interview was like, do you ever feel like you're preaching to the choir sometimes? And like, and I was like, uh, well now I absolutely am preaching to the choir because the choir is divided and splintered. And this was a song that was written for the body of Christ or just believers in Jesus. And, we make no bones about it. It's like the most important thing to, that we think right now is that there's unity within the body of Christ on any level. Cause it just feels like there's not much. And so as you guys have had the time to just really pour into this album, one of the other things that, you know, looking behind you here, like there's this whole studio that is yours that you guys mm. get to hang out in, which I got to say, I'm jealous. Like I'm super jealous. <laughs> uh, yeah. We love it, man. It's a dream come true. It came at the right time. And, I say it saved our lives. Our wives probably say it saved our marriage at times because we had somewhere to go during the pandemic. But yeah, we we spend a lot of time here. It's crazy. Just in what, 10, 15 years, you had to go to a studio. You had to go somewhere that invested a ton of money that did all the stuff to really produce an album well. Yeah. Now with today's technology, I mean, it still takes the work. It's still not cheap, but sure. it's a lot easier to do on your now. laptop. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is a studio, but it was more or less, it was just an escape where we could leave our stuff in place and just create. I mean, we'll track songs here, maybe, you know, one chunk of time a year. It's not that much, but, but I'm up here coming up with that I ideas and writing and lyrics stuff like that all the time. And so that's kind of what it's for. And we're just fortunate that we can actually track drums and get everything done when that time comes. But it's just, it's just a creative space that we've dreamed of and, we're in the middle of nowhere in the woods and it's just uh, not bothering anybody. And that's hard to leave sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the moments in writing this album, being able to just escape to the studio that made its way into the songs? What are some of those conversations, some of those moments that happened? Yeah, man. I mean, the title track always only Jesus was the conversation about most of the album was done. And we were like, we started seeing that theme of it all being just directly pointed at Christ and, that song kind of got written, not knowing it was going to be the, the, the album title, but by the time we were finished, we knew this is, this is the name. It was either that or then Christ came. And we just love always only Jesus being, it's what it's all about. And man, there's probably four or five of these songs were left over from the last album. And the other half are ones that we just kept writing. Interesting enough, one that took the least amount of writing was we did a cover, redid the hymn, nothing but blood of Jesus and just took the lyrics and revamped everything about it that was pretty awesome. That was the very last thing for the record pretty much. And 
it wasn't about programming and loops or anything like that. It was just the five of us literally like trying to find a kick drum sound. We were banging mallets on the couch and on the wall in here and, and just everything is, it is completely organic on that song. And just the five of us, you know, from the background vocals to everything, which we knew we were capable of doing. We just don't, you know, with producers, we just, you know, there's always stuff added to make it sound better. And on that one, we intentionally said, it's just us, like everything on here. If there's a sound we want, we create it, not pull it up off the internet or whatever. That was pretty special, especially for this space. And I didn't have to write any lyrics to it. So that was fun. Just had to get to go right into the creative production side of it. And, but that was probably my most enjoyable song to record on this album because it felt like, when we first started back in the day, we couldn't afford to have an album budget. We were making up sounds in our, in our house and rolling stuff down the hallway and trying to mic it. Like, it's funny. It's like when you don't have a budget, it's amazing how creative you get. And uh, it was fun to kind of go back to that, that kind of headspace and, and how it turned out. We wanted to make something incredibly beautiful. And I think we did. We were listening to that just this morning. So my wife and I both grew up in the more traditional churches. Yeah. We grew up on hymns. We still love the hymns. Yeah. Uh, when Chandler Moore did the hymn medley with Maverick yeah. City Music, like it wrecked me all 20 minutes of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we grew up on that. So we we're listening to that just earlier here. I mean, just both of us were just in awe. I mean, we just had a moment there just bringing back those old hymns and just how you guys did that. You know, you kept the heart of the hymn alive, but yeah. the simplicity of it came out. And it's like 10, 15 years ago, I would talk about, like when my oldest son, he's 20, when he was born, I was like, we don't hear hymns as much. And I want, I did these solo records, hymns right years ago, and I wanted him to kind of be aware of them. Well, now fast forward, it's not, don't hear him as much. You don't hear him at all. Yeah. And my kids have no clue about these. And so even in doing that, you know, to hear my 11 year old sing it full voice was like, it means something to me. He may get it one day, but it's like, there's just so much gold in those songs. And we I was telling my wife last night that let's see, we're two years away from like the, uh, let's see, 15, 20, yeah, the 10th anniversary of the first hymn. Well, no, the 20th anniversary of the first hymns record in 05. I'd so want to do another one around that, whether it's me or the band or whatever. And I just need a reason to do it. That's all. I just like, <laughs> I need to find the, carve out the time and do more of them because those are some of my favorite records I ever did. We're probably not doing the best with our 11 year old, but I mean, there's the theology, just the musicality of them. It's yeah. just, I don't know. It's, something that I think is a little bit lost. Like, like you, I just want to bring them back a little bit. Like I said, not only for, you know, the connection with our older generations and all that, but just yeah. bring that style back even just a bit. Yeah. I think it'll, everything seems to come back around at some point and it feels like, you know, back when I was doing the hymns thing, there was this kind of, I remember passion. Everybody was kind of doing this revisiting of hymns then. And it kind of became a thing for a moment before like the corporate worship thing just blew up. And I think there's always a place for it. It's just, you know, but it's like any storyteller from generation to generation, it's just somebody has to keep them alive and keep them going. And, and so any chance we get to do something like that is, I mean, I just, I'm selfishly, I love it. You know, and, and that I love so much because it's not even like me changing up that song. It's not like, it's a cardinal sin to change up Christmas songs too much. Cause what's wrong with the way they are. You know, you gotta be careful. I used to think about hymns, but just people aren't familiar with them enough to where it's like, I guarantee you won't have one person go, why'd you change up nothing but the blood? It's like, it's more or less, thanks for doing any version of nothing but the blood. And, and so, yeah, that's the fun part is there's no pressure on messing something up because if you don't give, give it a shot, it's just not getting heard that much. Well, as we start wrapping up this episode, Bart, one of the things that I really miss from you guys Oh, is, no. <laughs> oh yes oh oh yes that i think you guys absolutely need to bring back yeah we, we gotta bring those back we gotta bring those back Bart. yeah you're not the first one to say that we've talked about it but we're like one of the last ones like Obladi and some others that got so big that it was like, how do we top this? And, and like, it became like an all skate, everybody on tour got involved. And, but some of those first ones were like, that was time we were sitting around waiting to do shows or we just, we had all this time on our hands and, or had a, you know, a newborn baby that was asleep at the house and we <laughs> need to get out and do some. So half of those were after midnight, a little bitty office we rented years and years ago, you know, everything's funny after midnight and us just being so dumb and laughing our heads off never in the, the whole YouTube, everything was so new. We, 
you know, I remember posting on YouTube and it was like trying to figure out how, and, and it was, it wasn't supposed to be permanent. And, and then, uh, yeah, we should, my fear right now is that we'll overthink it. And the beauty of that is that it's so childish and so dumb. And now I feel like it's going to be too polished or whatever. That's been our concern was like, we got to go back to let's get a flip phone out and film it like we used to or something like that. <laughs> uh, I mean, all we need anymore is just an iPhone on the mount. And yeah, I mean, it seems like it was just like you were sitting on a cart or something like that for half of them. Yeah, oh yeah. 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 We did. We had a do- we found a dolly in that big hallway and they set me on it and a couple of guys and just started pushing it. And yeah, it still wasn't that creative, but it looked great. Yeah. <laughs> See, that was like 10, I think the last one was about 10 years ago, give or take, just going yeah, by what I can gosh. find on YouTube. Yeah, it sounds about right. I think uh, Obladi and Beat It or Baby were the last couple ones we did on that in that same hallway on tour in Fresno. Every time we go back to it, we'd do one for a couple of years. And then that was during the Rock and Road Show. And then after that, it was just like, yeah, we just didn't know how to top it. And so it would be fun to bring it back or do it on some level or something, the equivalent of that. I don't know. We'll see. We'll yeah. figure out something else to make us like 11 year olds. Well, <laughs> next time you're in Dallas, we'll just have to do it. There you go. When you come back for a home show there, you know, it's funny. There's a few of those to where like, there's one where Disney had us come in animal kingdom before they opened. They wanted us to do one and it was fun, but it was, it wasn't the same. Like they had Baloo and a couple of mascots. I mean, years ago, I remember the Rangers were like, come do one at the stadium. And that was hard because we're not dude perfect. Like it was kind of losing its, the fact that we're in a broom closet or in, you know, trying to make it work. More people want to get involved. We had literally had somebody want to sponsor it. Like, as, and we were like, I don't think this thing needs sponsor. Like, yeah, we kind of drifted away from that, but that was the hard part. So it'd have to be us coming back here. Okay. Let's meet at 1am and just us being corny and with no intentions of posting it, that's when it'll be funny. And then we'll figure out if we're going to put it up. <laughs> yeah, I'm here for it. Well, Bart, just thank yeah. you so much for taking a bit to hang out with us here. Yeah, man. My pleasure. Anytime. Anytime.